Welcome back. It's time now for the France 24 debate. Now, for 28 years, the city of Berlin was divided by a wall, a wall which separated communist East Germany from the West. But in 1989, a rapid chain of events in other former Soviet, former Soviet countries saw the Iron Curtain begin to buckle. And then in November of that year, within just a matter of a few days, the Berlin Wall started crumbling, making for one of the most memorable scenes in recent history. France 24's Julia Kim starts by taking a look back at those events. Standing on the wall at the Brandenburg Gate. Thousands of East Germans have just crossed the border into West Berlin. This wall, a symbol of the Cold War that had imprisoned them for 28 years, two months and 27 days, had finally fallen. I can't believe it. It's marvelous. It's fantastic. For three years, I've asked to go to West Berlin, and now here I am. For months, East Germans had protested for democracy. On the 4th of November in East Berlin, one million people took to the streets. Then came the fateful day. At an afternoon press conference on the 9th, Socialist Party spokesman Gunter Schabowski accidentally announced the border would be opened immediately. A few hours later, thousands of Berliners dashed to the crossing points that lined the wall. Confronted with the huge crowd, Lieutenant Harold Jäger is overwhelmed. He asks for instructions from his superiors, who fail to respond. So he opens the border. Years later, he reminisces. It was the most beautiful and the most terrible night of my life. Terrible because I realized that the party had abandoned me. My vision of the world shattered that night. A collapse that sparked mass euphoria. Those from the East were welcomed with open arms by those from the West, and the wall of shame became one of unity. It was chaos, but not one drop of blood was shed. At first reluctant, authorities too joined the protesters, and Chancellor Kohl cut short his trip to Poland to return home. It was one of the greatest days of my life. It had always been my goal to pursue a unified Germany. His goal was rapidly accomplished. Eleven months later, Germany was reunified and Berlin became a symbol of freedom. Well, those events were the climax of what had been a turbulent year, and it marked the beginning of what would be a new world order. Just a month after the wall came down, the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and the US President George H.W. Bush sat side by side in Malta, and they released a statement saying that the Cold War between the two powers was coming to a close. Well, in the months and years that followed, new countries were born, and Germany was reunified. Well, in today's edition of the France 24 debate, we examine what led to those events exactly 30 years ago, what was the immediate and longer term consequence, and we ask, to what extent do we still live in the shadow of the Berlin Wall? Well, to discuss those issues and more broadly where Germany is heading right now, I'm joined here in the studio by Catherine Field, who is the former Berlin correspondent of the Observer newspaper. Uh, you actually covered the fall of the wall. Um, I'm also joined to my left by Franz Helms, who is a consultant at the OECD, who is from East Germany. But uh, I won't say how old you are, but you were born after 1989. Yes. <laughs> um, and to my right is Mario Del Pero, who is a professor of international history at Sciences Po and an author of several books on the Cold War. Welcome to you. Thanks for having me. And last but not least from Berlin, I'm joined by Elsa Gabriel, who is a visual artist and a professor at the Weissensee Art Academy in Berlin. Let me go straight to you, Elsa, in uh, Berlin. I want to start by asking you, because you were there, uh, what happened when the wall came down? What was the what were the immediate events that struck you in the days that followed the fall of the wall? Well, uh, I was incidentally on the west side of uh, the wall um, for the yeah, pretty much for the very first time. Uh, I 
tried to get out uh, several times for relative reasons, uh, birthdays and uh, funerals and so on, and I couldn't make it. And finally, I uh, made it via a passport with an exhibition to West Berlin. And uh, at this particular night, I sat with uh, three of my colleagues and we were planning an art performance a few days afterwards in a West Berlin gallery. And then we went to a friend and we uh, were expected there to have dinner. And he opened the door and said, all right, um, the wall is open. And we said, all right, uh, OK, uh, we are joking later, but uh, now what do you have for dinner? Mm -hmm. And then he turned on the TV and, uh, well, we, we saw this uh, spectacular uh, press conference and uh, couldn't really believe it. We, we first thought that it's kind of a whatever comedy series or something. And later on, I went with a friend of mine, uh, one of the performance group actors, uh, to the uh, Checkpoint Charlie, actually. Because we were in the Sosna Straße, so we could make it on, uh, on foot. And we dropped by in a pub there uh, at the Friedrichstraße on the west side. And uh, th this was the most magic moment because it was completely silent. And only the radio was, was on and, and just some Schlager popular music was running. And uh, there were two groups of construction workers, the one from West Berlin and the others from East Berlin. They just strictly came from the shift and they all had beers and said nothing. So it was completely silent and no one could really believe what is going on. And it was quite before the, all this Vans and Vans and circus at the uh, Checkpoint Charlie and Brandenburg Gate. Yeah, just looking at those pictures bring, brings it all back. We've been looking at the images of the wall <laughs> sort of coming down as you were speaking. Let me turn to you, Catherine, because, of course, you were a, a journalist based in Berlin. You covered those events. You were there in 89. Yeah. I mean, clearly there was a huge sense of excitement and presumably as well, a huge sense of surprise. There was a huge sense of surprise. Uh, I remember the night that it happened, we were driving back to East Berlin. We'd been in Rostock because at that time, the whole of East Germany had different rallies, protests going on. It wasn't just protests in Leipzig and Dresden. And we drove in and we heard on the radio, the walls open up. Gosh, you know, we've only been out of town for an hour and a half. As so we drove through Prenzlauer Berg, which is one of those working class suburbs that's right in the center of East Berlin. And it really was like a cartoon series where all the windows were open, people were hanging out of the windows, calling out to one another, people were on the streets, people were waving us down saying, can you give us a ride to Friedrichstraße? We've got to get to Friedrichstraße to go to West Berlin. And so we bundled these youngsters in the back of our car, drove them to Friedrichstraße. And it was so incredible because they were aged in their 20s and they were asking us do you think this is really going to happen is it really going to happen I said, gee I don't know we're on we're in completely uncharted territory here and so we just gave them what Deutschmarks we had and said go to West Berlin have a good time and then it was a matter of just going back to East Berlin getting my car and then we just spent the whole night on the Berlin Wall because in those days you know a Sunday newspaper you just had all night to party and you didn't have to file for you know, 12 hours so it was just on top of the wall having a good time with everyone else complete euphoria thank you well professor mario del perro you, you weren't there uh, but you were of course observing those yeah. events like many of us around the world on our, on our televisions um i mean i just want to ask you for some context about this because is it fair to say or do you think it's an exaggeration to say that the effect of the fall of the berlin wall was the biggest single event in bringing about the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, there is indeed a connection between the two because the, f the fall of the wall symbolized the crash, the crumbling of the legitimacy of the socialist, I'd say experiment, a political experiment in Central Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Uh, the fall clearly showed there was no way forward for that system. At most, it could contain the damage. Uh, the Soviet Union was, you know, trying to reform itself, and it was doing so by fostering new relations with the West, uh, 
and especially with Germany. Uh, somehow West Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, managed to pilot uh, the transition, and it was a long-term process, which had begun especially in the 1970s with the Ostpolitik, the opening to the East, and with an attempt to engage first and foremost financially. I mean, in terms of the credits provided by West Germany to the Soviet Union, to Poland, to other uh, uh, socialist regimes created a link, a tie between the two and therefore allowed West Germany to somehow be able to shape and influence and even drive the process. So the fall of the wall was a key moment for its symbolic value but also because it showed the ability of the West to somehow contain the potential dangerous spillovers of what was going on. It wasn't a given that the process would be so smooth. It wasn't a given that the transition could be so peaceful in the end. And sometimes we tend to forget that. Okay, so a really dra a dramatic climax, wasn't it, at the end of, almost at the end of what had been a very dramatic year, although there were further dramas in other countries before the year 1989 was up. Uh, let me turn to you, Franz, uh, last but not least. You were, of course, born after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, so there was never any Berlin Wall or any meaningful part of the Berlin Wall when you were growing up. But did you feel its presence nevertheless in any way? In a very strange way. So I believe I'm part of a generation that comes from a country it never really lived in. And there are so many aspects in, in, in which this experience maybe changed or influences my life today. Uh, but I find it extremely difficult to, to point towards one one specific fact, and um, I, I realized it's, it's only later that you actually realize that there was something more, maybe something different, but of course I didn't grow up thinking of my childhood as any, anything special. But did you grow up, for example, talking about the fall of the wall and its possible consequences, its immediate consequences, at the sort of family dinner table? I do not remember this, but what I remember is that my parents had a rather negative view of the GDR. They experienced the fact that they were not allowed to travel as a restriction. They were not allowed to study what they wanted to study. Um, and so, of course, for them, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall was something very positive. And I gather there were some anecdotes in your family that members of the family had actually been under the surveillance of the Stasi. Uh, and you did some research into that uh, uh, surveillance a bit later on. What did you find out? Um, yes, my family was under surveillance by the Stasi, as so many other East Germans. Um, and I actually happened to meet a person that was surveying, that was spying upon my family in a very strange encounter. Um, she, my grandfather was a doctor and this person was working in the cabinet of my, my grandfather. And as I had a doctor's appointment and one, at one moment, I was just sitting in front of her and I knew her and she knew me, though she didn't know if I know what she was doing at the, at the time. And I, I felt an, an, extremely, an extreme awkwardness in this moment. And maybe this, this awkwardness is also a little bit emblematic of, of how my generation is confused about the, the past in this area. Let me turn back to Elsa in, uh, in Berlin, who's standing by for us. Now, you were arrested in October 1989, so just a month or so before uh, the wall came down. I mean, that must have been uh, terrifying. Tell me a little bit about that. And also, just tell me more broadly, before we wrap up this first half, what was your sort of impression from being on the eastern side of the uh, wall most of your life of what life in West Germany was like? Well, uh, first of all, I grew up pretty close to the border, actually, but not in Berlin, in uh, the, close to the Harz Mountains. So this was a part uh, approximately 30 kilometers away from the wall. But you never, ever could really see or feel the wall. So it was only in your head somehow. You knew that you never could make it over the wall, but you had it, you didn't have any physical contact to it. You had a few parts in uh, East Berlin where you could see it, but uh, mainly it was just uh, this weird situation that you were trapped, but uh, not really feeling the the, uh, the borders or so, so a little bit like the Truman story or something like that, so that you are uh, surveillance all the time. Uh, and on the other hand, you never really know you are in a, in a, a supposedly uh, a perfect world. You we grew up in the better uh, part of the, uh, Germany and, and in the better system of uh, the both. 
And uh, I studied art. I could study art uh, beside the fact that I am uh, from a, a church household. Uh, my father was a preacher in Halberstadt. And uh, well, I told my mother already when I turned 12 that I'm going to leave the GDR because I won't live my whole life until I'm 65 to leave it when I'm uh, a pensioner. So, well, it took a while and I got married finally to a man from West Berlin in, in the end of September, on the 25th of September 1989. And a few days afterwards, 10 days, 12 days, 14 days afterwards, we went to the demonstrations uh, to the, first at the Alexanderplatz on the 7th of uh, October at the birthday of the Republic. And uh, then on the 8th again, and it was very, very interesting to be there and how it turned out. Uh, well, first it was very, very small and then it, it grew up and it was very friendly and people were not used to do demonstrations in the East, not uncontrolled demonstrations and the policemen weren't really used to it, how it works, demonstrators and uh, what's going on. So everyone mm. was insecure about the situation. Okay. And All right. then Sorry to cut you short. Sorry hours. to cut you short. We're, we're, we're out of time. We'll, we'll come back to you yeah. in the second half and pick up on the story about uh, the time you were arrested in All part right. two. You've yeah, had well, the no last problem. word in the yeah, first yeah. half. Thank you very much indeed. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It is time now for part two of the France 24 debate. Today, we're turning our attention to the fall of the Berlin Wall, which crumbled in 1989. Well, on this 30th anniversary, we examine how those events came about, what the fall of the wall changed, and to what extent people's lives are still affected by the concrete wall that once divided what is today the capital of a united Germany. Well, I'm joined here in the studio by Catherine Field, former Berlin correspondent for the Observer newspaper. I'm also joined to my left by Franz Helms, who is a consultant at the OECD, who is from East Germany. Uh, also here with me in the studio is Mario Del Pero, who is a professor of international history at Sciences Po University. Welcome back to you. And in Berlin is Elsa Gabriel, a visual artist and a professor at the Weissensee Art Academy in Berlin. Uh, just before we had a break uh, there, Elsa, you were telling us uh, about your experiences of the fall of the wall. And just a couple of weeks before that actually happened, uh, you were arrested. Tell us just again what happened then. Yeah, well, this was, uh, we got arrested in, well, by accident, actually, we, because uh, it was so, such a weird situation that no one really knew what was going on, and all of a sudden people got sucked in, and, uh, well, we, it was this one night where it uh, came to this critical point where you really didn't really know what is going, what is going to happen next, so, uh, whether it's uh, going the brutal way or the soft way. So it, uh, I st had to stand still with many others, hundreds of others, uh, 10 hours uh, in front of a wall, so just not moving. Whoever moved got beaten. And, uh, well, you have a lot of time uh, from midnight till 10 in the morning to think over your whole life and what brought you there. So finally we got uh, set, we, we were set free, but, but we didn't know that uh, at this particular point. And I was already on my way out of the GDR, so I was really kind of pissed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Catherine, you were a journalist in Berlin at that very moment. I mean, the year 1989 must have been a fantastic year to have been a journalist. Uh, so many extraordinary uh, events. I mean, did all of that take you hugely by surprise? I mean, uh, when, you, when you went from being followed to not being followed, presumably overnight, because you were under surveillance yeah, too. Yeah, we did. Uh, looking back on it, it was pretty obvious what was going to happen. But at the time, you didn't know, because let's not forget... Everything was so uncertain because we had Glasnost, Perestroika, we had Gorbachev coming in and saying, this is all going to change, now it's all going to change. And Eric Honecker, then leader in East Germany, had said, well, we've got nothing to change. We've got the perfect society here. We've got socialist rules, nothing to change. And, of course, we had that very important speech of Mikhail Gorbachev to the UN at the end of 1988 where he said, everyone has the right to be free. And at that stage, no one really knew what was going on. 
Um, but when you say it must have been exciting, well, let's not forget that also there was unrest in Poland. There were demonstrations in Poland. There'd been crackdowns in Poland. We also had that same year Tiananmen. So no one was really thinking at that stage, this is, this is all going to turn out well. And I was there the evening that uh, your guest in Berlin got arrested. And it was really, really very dangerous because a lot of people out on the street, Mikhail Gorbachev was in town for the anniversary of the founding of the GDR. And people went on the streets and they were calling out, Gorby, help us, Gorby, help us. And no one had ever had this before. And quite rightly, the police didn't know what to do. They couldn't crack down because Mikhail Gorbachev is in town and you can't have the Soviet leader with Eric Honecker driving through and seeing policemen, secret police, who are whacking people over the head. So the demonstrators had a couple of hours to make it known to Eric Honecker that, that really their patience was running out. So you're quite right, it was an incredible moment but there was really right up until actually beyond the fall of the Berlin Wall or the opening of the Berlin Wall, there was no real certainty that it wasn't going to turn dangerous. And Professor, I mean, we were talking there, I mean, we were just hearing about how, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev had sort of showed a slightly softer approach than some of his predecessors, Glasnost, Perestroika and so on. Uh, and, you know, it's puzzling to some people why there in East Germany, it wasn't a sort of Tiananmen Square style scenario, which of course was in the same year, 1989. Why was it, do you think, that uh, force wasn't used or, you know, why didn't the authorities open fire on people as that protest movement got underway? Now, force had been used even in the weeks before uh, uh, the fall of the wall. Uh, at that point, uh, there were two dimensions leading the events uh, in a certain direction. The first one was that the Soviet Union was not, not willing anymore to support the regime, and it was not even interested anymore in preserving a control of Central Eastern Europe. Uh, we always look at Gorbachev's social and economic reform, but Gorbachev had a geopolitical vision in which there was no space for a security control of Central Eastern Europe. It was a, a vision in which Europe would come together, a common home, that was the rhetoric he used. So there was no Soviet Union supporting the regime anymore, and there was a sort of snowball effect for what was going on elsewhere in the former or what was bound to become the former Soviet bloc, Hungary, Poland, reforms everywhere. I mean, at that point, the GDR was unable to stand on its own on the one side, and it was snowballed itself, if I can use this expression, by what was going on elsewhere in Central Eastern Europe. I think you're right to bring up that point of Hungary and Poland because for a long time it looked as though the bloc would survive but that Hungary and Poland would have more open economy, would be able to sort of find some sort of way of staying within that sort of Eastern Europe, Eastern and Central Europe, but without being so, in, so much part of the Western Europe. If I may add one sure. point, we look back as if it was inevitable. Inevitable the fall of the wall, inevitable the lack of violence and so forth and so on. Now, history is never inevitable. Uh, many little events contributed to, to the peaceful uh, fall of the wall, mistakes in communication by the GDR governments, and also the bottom-up activism, mobilization of people, which created something that was uncontainable, unconstrainable, and one could say unstoppable at the end. And this bottom-up dimension is very important when we study 1989 and what happened in the socialist regimes of Central Eastern Europe. And sometimes it is forgotten by focusing so much on high politics, high diplomacy, geopolitics, or the structural forces of history, economic changes, and so forth and so on. Yeah, and because you were there, Catherine, yeah. I mean, do you think there's a difference between the narrative about the fall of the Berlin Wall in the year 2019 versus, let's say, a week after those events had happened themselves, the sort of conversations you were having oh, yeah. in 89. I mean, everything was suddenly right up in the air. No one really knew. I mean, still at that stage, don't forget, the CIA, right up until the fall of the Berlin Wall, thought, well, you know, Gorbachev is kind of good, and maybe he's going to last, but no one was really sure this was happening. So when we look back, we think it was just this euphoria, but it wasn't. It was very uncertain. The night after the Berlin Wall was opened, there were still troops circling around 
East Berlin. It was still talk within the Politburo of closing the border again. It was one night when everyone was really happy. But then after that, no one knew. And it really wasn't until then German Chancellor Helmut Kohl and his foreign minister, Hans-Jürgen Genscher, really got on the levers. They were, they were in the driving seat. And once they got going, that was when the whole narrative went that this was going to be a moment in history. This was going to be, looking back on it, exactly when the whole of the global structure changed. Germany was going to be unified. That was going to be the end. And this was a whole new ball game. Yeah, we're going to talk a bit more about the uh, reunification of Germany in, in just a moment. Um, but I wanted to turn to you, Franz, because you're first and foremost an economist. You're at the OECD. Um, I mean, there was huge inequality between the East and the West in terms of living standards. We all know that uh, about that era there 30 years ago. But today, does any of that inequality live on? Mm -hmm. So, of course, I cannot speak on behalf of the OECD, um, but on a rather personal note, I, I do believe that that it doesn't boil down only to to financial capital, like these differences. There's so many so many other aspects that also play a role, like socially or culturally, and and so on. And so, for example, I I think that in terms of of uh, culture of debate, for example, or of uh, engagement with the past, these were things that were very different in in East Germany compared to West Germany, and there was no 1968 in in East Germany. And uh, you know, did people feel, and do, do people still feel in East Germany that there is a sort of a slight sense of discrimination? I've I've heard it mentioned there is a sense of us and them, even now, between people who live in East Germany and people who live in, in, in West Germany, even though those barriers don't, don't exist any longer. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I never experienced these barriers myself, mm. um, though I, I came to see these differences maybe when, for the first time, I, when I was studying, I actually had for the first time friends in my age from West Germany, and they had very different experiences growing up. They, I felt that they had a greater openness, mm. they were speaking more languages, they would have travel to different places or maybe have parents that were able to travel to different places. And these were, were things that I didn't know from my environment. And also something that I would like to mention is that I felt that many of my, my West German friends, they were able to tell me quite precisely about the, the, the past of their families. And they, they, know, they knew very well uh, about the, the Nazi period and their, and their families. And this was something that we never really talked about in, in East Germany. So it had a sort of a slightly different syllabus, a different different type of uh, conversation. Yes, very different upbringing. Uh, let me turn to you, Elsa, because you, of course, still teach people. You're a professor there in uh, in Berlin. I mean, do you notice a difference between the uh, pre eighty nine generation and the post eighty nine generation? Is there is there a uh, a big difference um, mentally between the people that you meet uh, in in daily life? Well, it's hard to tell. It's, it's, uh, well, first of all, there is a difference. There's a difference between people who students, even if they grew up after the fall of the wall uh, in East Germany or in West Germany or Western Europe. Well, uh, this is the seventh uh, academy I'm teaching, and so I uh, and the first in the East, actually. So uh, all the others were in the West, and even there, I instantly. Uh, recognized and and uh, find out who one came from uh, East Germany even if they went to West Germany with their parents before 89 or so so there's a different socialization or something so they feel not that certain and uh, kind of uh, confident of everything so it's 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 really hard to tell it's minimal but it's uh, for for me as uh, being grown up in East Germany it's it's still there and it's a it's a great quality in uh, observing uh, the world and having a different perspective and I think it's very uh, important to focus on that uh, certain whatever this East German East European point of view or so and it's uh, to less estimated I guess so just to sort of summarize this 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 conversation in the debate I mean would you say that today there is almost no difference between someone who is from what was geographically East Germany and what is today geographically West Germany? Would you say that the differences of more or less being sort of uh, ironed out as, as, as the years go by? Me? 
as a talking note, there, there is a big difference. There is a huge difference. Even actually, today. And it's hard to, yeah, either today. And it's, uh, it's so hard to communicate because it's about communication and both sides are speaking German. And that makes the problem even bigger because both sides are kind of, uh, they, they expect to understand each other, but they won't. And this is still going on, of course. Uh, and Catherine, let me turn to you. When you were in uh, Germany, in Berlin, pre-89, I mean, what was the perception of what life was like on the other side of the wall amongst the people you spoke to? Did they think it was all sort of the, the pavements were paved with gold? Uh, what was the sort of the, the biggest misconception to yeah, well, against? You have to remember that if, wherever you were in East Germany, apart from the area around Dresden, you could watch West German TV. All West German TV was pumped into East Germany. So people knew what was going on. And so they knew what they were missing out on. Uh, they knew, you know, they watched TV programs, they watched soap operas, so they pretty much knew what, what it was. But the basic bottom line was they knew in the West that they would have human rights. They knew they could go and vote. They knew they could mix with whoever they wanted, that there wouldn't be someone, you know, a man with a hat and soft shoes walking past, walking just behind them when they went down the street, that they had all these freedoms. So it was less of a you know, paved with gold than more sort of just knowing exactly the freedoms that they were missing out on. And, and just talking now about the unification of Germany, I mean, how how do you feel, and this is open to you, I mean, how do you feel that, that how, how whole process was managed? I mean, was it done, it happened very quickly, uh, perhaps it took Less people by year. surprise. Exactly. Less I mean, yeah. did that, was it something that with the passage of time, you know, perhaps things could have been done differently? Was it done... Well, it's been described as uh, one of the greatest gains for human freedom in history, uh, according to some. Do you agree? Uh, yes and no. It was quick and fast, and it had to be. There were huge constraints. Uh, there were pressures from below. Uh, there were many in Europe uh, who were against it. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, the, the British uh, Prime Minister. Uh, we have to consider that the division of Germany, brutal as it was, and the division of Europe, has somehow solved a major geopolitical issue, the German question. And so it was considered by many a way to stabilize Europe and guarantee peace in Europe. The Italian foreign minister, uh, Giulio Androtti, in 1985, said, I love so much Germany that I prefer to have two of them, because it was a way to stabilize the continent, and many celebrated the stability that such division has brought to Europe. Harry Kissinger, 1988, Europe is stable thanks to the uh, uh, bipolar division of Europe. So it came quickly possibly too rapidly. Mistakes were made. The one-to-one -one rate of exchange between the, the, the West German mark and the East German mark was a way to subsidize East Germany, but created multiple problems afterwards. But if we take the long-term perspective, the history of Germany post-1989 is a fairly successful history, less so the history of Germany within the EU, I think. That's the different matter. Does that, yeah, does that I, I agree. I mean, mm. there was nothing else that could be done other than the unification of Germany. Once that it was obvious that East Germany wasn't going to survive. And, and really, during those first months, there were a lot of attempts to somehow make the GDR survive. There were roundtable discussions between some of those people in the church peace movement. There was also sort of various governments came along. There were a lot of different prime ministers of East Germany during that time. They were sort of put in to, to look after the shop while behind the scenes they were trying to make everything work and it just was not going to work because Germany needed to be united it was not going to not be united because Helmut Kohl wanted it to be and they were out to do it and it was done I mean, they were up against a lot of suspicion I mean, let's remember that the then French president Mitterrand he was against it he actually just after the wall opened went to Leipzig uh, to try and sort of talk to people about how it could survive so it wasn't a given by some, but it really was just the German people saying it had to be. And if we think back to those early demonstrations, do you remember when they were saying, wir sind das Volk, we are the people? They changed to wir sind ein Volk, we're one people. So they already had the crowds on the streets saying, wir sind ein Volk, <coughs> we're one people. And their patience was just really, really at the limit. And there was a big question that if those demands to be one, to have human rights, civil rights, 
if that wasn't going to be met, then uh, you know, then there was going to be the risk of, of danger. And then also this aspect we haven't brought up is that people were leaving East Germany in enormous numbers. When the wall uh, was opened, eight, up to that period in the month before, 8,000 people were leaving a day. And so the country was literally like a siphon. They were just leaving because they were going out through Czechoslovakia. So this whole thing, it had to be unification or else people were, were just not going to live there. Let me turn to Elsa in, uh, in, in Berlin I mean, and your sort of observations and your sort of perspective on the unification of Germany 30 years on. I mean, uh, what, what's your feeling? Was it, was it handled correctly? Was it done as it should have been done? Well, uh, difficult to say, but I think it's uh, just there, there was no choice. So it had had to be done quickly and rapidly. And uh, like some of the one of the politicians said, uh, the next re reunification, we do better. Um, well, I think it's an historic moment and I think it's uh, the way it is. So uh, no doubt there were failures, but uh, on the other hand, it needs to be uh, kind co kind of considered that for the West Germans it was the end of a period and for the East Germans it was the beginning of a new period. So th this is something that makes up differences up till today, I guess. Um, let's just turn our eye to sort of the present day and this is really open to all of you. I mean, the sort of the direction Germany is heading in right now I and mean, we've got uh, the rise of populism in many parts of the world, not just in Europe, but notably in Germany and in pockets of Germany. Uh, you know, there's a Nazi emergency which has just been declared in Dresden. I mean, does it look like for the first time since 89, Germany is sort of at risk of going down a rather uh, unsavoury route, do you think? Let's not forget that the majority of Germans, they still vote for democratic parties. and. Though we, of course, have to see that there's a massive change in the in the way we are having debates right now. And now you can say things that you were not able to say before, but that you maybe also didn't need to say. And, and I believe that this is very frightening indeed. And uh, what, what are your thoughts about how, how would you would, what would you do to explain the rise of uh, how do you explain the rise of populism in well, Germany I, today? I actually agree that the rise of the far right in Germany is possibly less troubling than in other parts of Europe. It is an issue in some cities, in some regions. To me, the most troubling issue when it comes to Germany and Germany within the EU is that Germany has not been able to stand up to its natural role as leader of the EU. We have seen it. We have seen this in the in the aftermath of the 2008-2009 economic crisis an obsession for inflation, austerity during the Greek crisis. So I think that the reunification has created a superior power within the EU, a leader, possibly a hegemon, who is unable to fulfill its role and its mission. I, I think you're right, but perhaps that will be a generational thing that once we have you know, Angela Merkel shuffles away as she seems to be on her way to doing and we have a new younger chancellor who doesn't feel as though they're so so much constrained by the history of Germany not just the history of division but also the Nazi division um, but I agree with you it's not really so much of a danger in Germany the rise of the far right because when you sort of balance it all out you look at the rise of the Greens as well they're having enormous success in Germany and there's a whole new generation that's coming along and I, th I think it's unfair on Germany when you look at the, the strides it has made, particularly since the end of the Second World War, to say it's at risk of going down a nasty path, because it's a very stable country. But there is another concern for Germany. It's coming from outside. There is a sort of anti-German sentiment in pockets of Europe, notably in, in Italy and uh, in, in Greece, uh, for uh, the reasons of austerity and, and, and perhaps other reasons too. I mean, is that something we should be worried about? I think so, absolutely. And I think so because, uh, as I said, Germany happens to be the engine of EU economic growth, the main trade partner of a variety of countries, Italy among them. And Germany is by far the most influential, I'd say, hegemonic uh, uh, power. 
if this kind of anti-German sentiment takes hold and consolidates, and that is, that is happening, well, even the European project will be at risk. There is no future for the EU without German involvement, German leadership, and a broad consensus on German leadership. Um, we're coming to the end of this debate, and I just want to wrap up by looking at a theme that we've been talking about a bit in the news here, this theme of sort of nostalgia for those days of the Berlin Wall. We've been looking at a report on France 24 the last 24 hours about old things uh, that were used in East Germany, uh, cars, design, furniture and things that have now come back into fashion. And of course, we've all seen the film uh, Goodbye Lenin. Let me go to you, Elsa. I mean, uh, you lived in East Germany at a time when the wall was up. Is there anything you're nostalgic about whatsoever uh, for that era? No. <laughs> Simply to say, no. Well, I just, I, I, I uh, actually collected a lot of old things and I still have them storage because I did a lot of performances, uh, media performances for uh, photo and for video with my family, my two kids and my partner. So uh, therefore we kind of reenacted some of the uh, East German situations and well, that's enough, I guess. It's, I, I'm not nostalgic at any point. OK, we've got time for one more uh, question. I'm going to put that same question to, to France. You didn't grow up in that era. You were born after the war went up. But is there anything about that era that makes you think, I wish I had been around then? Hmm. That's a very difficult question. Um, no, <laughs> I, 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 simply, I simply would say no, yeah. There's nothing your parents told you, your grandparents told you, that made you think, wow. It's pretty much bound to bad. the experience my, parent, my parents had. Uh, and they had a rather negative experience of the GDR. So I would say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not nostalgic of anything. And can I give you the last word? You were there, you were growing up. I mean, you were, you were working there. You growing were up. working <laughs> there, you were growing up. Catherine, anything that you would... Absolutely Go none. Absolutely. I, I okay. agree with you. There was, you know, it, was, it was a good idea. It, it didn't work out. Okay. Well, that makes people's lives were destroyed because of the secret police. What well, there was nothing, you know, yeah. They built, they built up a part of Germany that was destroyed at the end of the Second World War. They housed people at a time when people need housing, need education, but then once that happened, it was just people's lives were destroyed. Okay, well, you have had the final word. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed, Catherine Field, former Berlin correspondent for the Observer newspaper. Thank you very much indeed Thank to you. you. Thank you to Franz Helms, consultant at the OECD. Uh, who's from East Germany, Mario Del Pero, Professor of International History at Sciences Po. And last but not least, Elsa Gabriel from Berlin, visual artist and professor at the Weissensee Art Academy. That was today's debate. <laughs>